thank you for coming. Uh, there will be more cookies at the end. <laughs> so stick around. All right, so my uh, tiny tech talk is about macaroons, which as I discovered on the way down here, no one has any idea what they are. Um, I didn't either until I think it was Brad posted a link to it in RS email or somebody did. Um, it was kind of an interesting article that kind of led me to the white paper that Google had put out um, about macaroons. Um, effectively, they're uh, a different way of storing uh, a bearer token for use across multiple web services. So, macarons or runes, I don't know, first macarons. Uh, the ones on the left are like the original French ones, the ones on the right are like Americanized. That's the end. Thanks. All right, so let's let's cover cookies. Um, I think pretty much anybody in here knows um, about how cookies work here. Um, they're a extremely simple um, implementation. Uh, they do have a slight hidden cost of server-side uh, authorization checks. Um, so just having the cookie, although it um, will authenticate you as uh, as someone. Um, usually services have to perform extra actions within uh, their services to uh, make sure that you're allowed to do those. Uh, it's got an easy adoption. Um, all browsers at this point should have uh, pretty solid implementations. The, um, the idea here is that um, the cookie itself um, is the token and by just by carrying it around is um, having all the proof you need. Um, of course that's kind of a, a downside because uh, uh, for instance, if anyone remembers FireSheep, which was that Firefox plugin that allowed you to uh, listen for uh, cookies on insecure connections, well, you know, it was really easy to suddenly become someone and hijack their session. Um, they can be used for, uh, in, in addition to kind of uh, the typical authentication, like you've, so you've logged in type thing, they can be used for anonymous tracking and uh, other transient uh, contexts. So it's not just about the sessions. Um, it's also about um, uh, advertisers tracking uh, anonymous behavior and things like that. Uh, so let's go on to SPKI. Um, this is another way of, of tracking authentication across services. It's kind of, uh, it's much more complicated than just a basic cookie. Um, it was originally created to go beyond the, the normal X509 certificate structure. Um, uh, that is typically used for um, uh, PKI and PGP, um, two things that probably most everybody in here understands. Um, it's no longer sufficient enough just for uh, large communities. Um, at some point, um, it becomes too complicated to try and figure out who someone is simply based on, on signing their name and saying that this person is this person um, and trusting that. Uh, it, it's also kind of tied to a long-lived authentication and authorization um, process, uh, something that uh, cookies allow you to do, um, where that uh, was anonymous tracking and, and things like that. But with um, public key infrastructure, it's it's difficult to allow that to happen because it's so closely tied to uh, an identity. Um, it's also expensive in terms of infra infrastructure and uh, deployment to distributed systems. Um, checking the chain of trust for these. Um, can be highly expensive um, when you need to when you need to track it back to see if you can trust um, It's it's a lot of operations. It's pretty heavy um, One one of the uh, one of the interesting bits is that it still kind of remains a theory um, the actual data specification for tracking um, uh, actual data within the signed uh, uh, For tracking signed data does not appear to have reached RFC state um, uh, a lot of the ones that I found online expired in 1998, and I guess were never really pulled through. Um, and the last one is certificate revocation. Um, these days, a lot of people don't even use it. Um, I know Chrome has it turned off by default. Um, it's just too difficult to actually uh, deploy that because um, the cost is too high. So how do we... Um, how are we able to share permissions across the systems? Um, for instance, I've got a, an example here where user A wants to allow user B uh, read-only access to their document on server X until Sunday. So there's a lot of very specific things that they want to, uh, to do in order to share this document. Um, 
typically uh, right now you, you'll see it solved in a lot of systems by using a combination of kind of unique URLs that are generated for someone to use and, um, and a server side auth um, where user B must have an account recognized by server X. Um, but we also have this other problem with um, sharing data access. It's, it's one of these like um, problems where a social service say wants to access your email to add contacts like LinkedIn or Facebook or something. It says, hey, give us your Google password. We promise we won't do anything nasty. Well, you know, okay, <laughs> that's, that's not super awesome. And then uh, OAuth 2, it's kind of a, uh, another, that's, this is more of a protocol level thing, uh, but um, solving that kind of problem where uh, you, you basically have to have these, these endpoints that are registered ahead of time by other services that then can be trusted. Um, it makes it a real pain for some things like uh, private label sites, which is something we uh, on the webmail team just recently ran into with our Dropbox integration where um, uh, serving up content from a private label site makes it very difficult to register all of them uh, that, that we have on, on the Dropbox uh, website for our application. So instead we have to make a really crazy white label um, service and expose it that way. So that leads to uh, this idea of macroons. It's, it's something that um, appears to be pretty new. Uh, Google put out a white paper about. Um, it's a combination um, of cookies and public keys uh, from a certain point of view. Uh, the, uh, the service point of view bit is, um, is basically a way that servers, um, instead of it being kind of client oriented where you give a token out um, to a specific end user and that's, that's the only bit, um, you're able to hand uh, these cookies off to other services which then can um, adjust them. Uh, so the way it works is um, kind of like a layered cookie where uh, one service will hand another service um, kind of a, a large scale um, all encompassing cookie and then that service can then tune it down per user to allow um, for more fine grain control. Uh, they, they're also interesting because um, they're so efficient and flexible that they allow a really small lifetime. So instead of like a long running signed session for instance. Um, you could, you could allow just one of these macaroons to exist for just a few seconds, set the timeout on it very low, and then allow that uh, request to go through. And it, if they need another one, they just ask for another one. Um, the three main bits of macaroons um, basically can be pulled into, uh, I guess, these three points here. Um, attenuation, so that's reducing access control um, of the macaroon through use of, uh, of something that they call caveats. Uh, delegation, which is uh, trusting other services to be able to do some of the work. So uh, that includes um, in attenuating the macaroon, uh, authenticating it, authorizing the, the user, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, the last one here is contextual confinement, which is sounds pretty crazy, but it's simply a way to um, check only the applicable uh, caveats against the context of whatever request that user is making. So that kind of leads to this concept um, called HMAC, which is how the macrons uh, use, uh, or ha basically how they define their ca caveats based on each other. Um, so it's not, this is not a way uh, to do data encryption. It's simply a way to basically sign data in a very simple way. Um, it's used to verify that the data that someone received is actually um, uh, correct uh, and, and has not been tampered with. So you'll see there in the middle um, the HMAC formula. Um, to, to do that, you basically pass in a key and a, uh, a message. M stands for message, and uh, the key is uh, some secret key that has been padded out. Um, so you can see that the, uh, the function basically does a hash on, um, on the secret key padded with an um, outer pad and then it's concatenated with a hash of the secret key with, uh, concatenated with the inner pad, concatenated with the message. Um, by doing this, it, it reduces tampering uh, by, um, by making it very difficult to actually um, uh, add on to the message, which some, some of the hash-based attacks allow you to do. Um, and uh, down here at the bottom, you can see kind of um, how this works. The, um, uh, on the left there, the key with the iPad is XORed. Um, those two elements are XORed, and so that 
creates this new element called I keypad. And then similarly, you can also um, create a key with the, um, the O pad, uh, which uh, both of those are constant values. Um, the O pad being o, uh, OX, 5C, and hex, um, and, and kind of extended out to be exactly one block, block size long. And uh, uh, same thing for the iPad, except with uh, OX36. Apparently, they, they picked these two because it reduces, I guess, overlap um, in terms of XORing. Uh, then you take basically those two values. Um, you take the iPad I keypad, uh, concatenate it with a message, run it through SHA1 uh, for your first sum. And then uh, you take that sum with the I keypad and run it through um, to generate your second sum. And that, that basically signs the data, preventing um, people from tampering with it. So let's talk about how we use that in terms of caveats then. Um, uh, in the macroon itself, it will have a list of caveats that can be defined. Um, and we'll go through an example here at the bottom. Um, it's, it's basically a successive uh, attenuation of the permissions. So um, a macroon may start with a very broad set of permissions, but um, the primary or secondary servers may then tune that down, um, coming up with a new caveat and then signing it uh, using the previous signature. So that way it's chained all the way down um, and it's very, uh, very difficult to actually uh, modify that without having prior knowledge of the, of the root key. So um, you can see on the, in the display on the, on the bottom left, it kind of starts with a, um, a random nonce and then runs it through the, uh, the HMAC uh, using a secret key. Um, I'm using key, uh, k.bs here to rec uh, represent like a, a block service, say they have their own um, secret key. Uh, they'll generate a, uh, um, a random nonce to be used as the root key, um, or excuse me, as the, uh, as the key ID, and uh, um, then take that, run it through the HMAC, and they'll end up with a signature, which is that 90 dash, uh, dot dot fc there on the bottom. Um, and those two pieces of data um, include uh, the longer bar on the top is basically the start of the, of the list of caveats uh, where it can be applied to. And the signature is, um, there's only ever one signature and it's continuously kept up to date with whatever caveats are in there. So step two would um, say we want to limit uh, that macaroon uh, to basically only allow on the block service um, access to chunks between uh, 100 and 500. Uh, uh, they want to be able to pull files out and we're saying, okay, well, um, we can basically tune this down because we don't want them full access to everything on the system. And they can only read, uh, read or write from these chunks. So um, we take that statement and we're able to put that into the macro and then run the, uh, the sig uh, run the HMAC on it to generate a new signature. Right? And you can see there it, uh, it runs the HMAC on the previous signature, that 90 FC, um, and the uh, the new uh, caveat data, which is uh, that we're limiting the chunk to uh, somewhere between 100 and 500 uh, blocks. And uh, that generates a new one. So then if we want to add another uh, caveat on top of that, for instance, the, the third one there with operation equals read, um, we can take that previous signature, generate a new one um, based on that, uh, op that new caveat, and we basically have a signature on all of those that only works um, if all of those are, are um, present in the macro. And so if anyone tries to tamper with it or add something new, um, they, uh, they won't be able to, to do that. Um, so another interesting part of it is that it's not just the initial server that creates the macro that um, can add these caveats, but um, third party servers are allowed to as well. Um, the private primary service may allow other services to basically attune the rights of the token bearer to um, to better match what their service needs to do. Um, in order to do this, they um, they add extra caveats um, onto the uh, onto the macaroon and um, keep uh, updating the signature. Um, for instance, in the in the example here, um, you can see on the left. Um, pretend there's a block storage service, and um, they provide a macaroon to a, a front-end web service for um, for them to be able to access um, any number of blocks. Um, well, I guess in the example here, actually, on, on the right, you'll see uh, they limit it to 100 to 500 blocks and read operations only. 
Um, those are the ones added by the Blocks uh, storage service. Um, and they're, they're kind of marked gray there. When they provide that to the web service, the web service can then, um, for depending on which client wants to access um, the web services uh, block storage, it can then attune that down. Um, and it will add um, its own caveats, for instance, limiting this client to only be able to read um, chunk 255 of, of the, of the uh, range of chunks that was allowed previously, and limiting it to um, only be allowed for uh, access if the client is coming from that specific IP address. And then after it generates those signatures, it's then able to generate the final signature for k.user, which um, allows the client to take that macaroon as it is, exists right then and send it over to the block storage for access. And block storage will check all these caveats and basically only allow um, that client to read from block 255 if they're coming from that one specific IP. Um, there's also this idea of third-party caveats being discharged um, using an additional macaroon. So when a third party adds these on there, um, it may be able to add um, uh, extra caveats that, that need to be um, authorized by an external um, service. And so that leads into discharge macaroons. Um, these are separate macaroons that are created and um, uh, by an external service to um, uh, basically tell the original service that one of the considerations has been fulfilled. Um, it allows, for instance, uh, authorization or authentication outside of the original service. Um, so um, a service is able to bring a third party in um, by saying, hey, you need to check with this other service, make sure this user um, is authenticated on that and then provide both of those macaroons to me in order to uh, have access. Um, um, at, it also kind of allows this idea of, of hashing the signature to prevent further chaining, um, uh, which I'll, I'll show you in just a second. And it may also be applied to multiple macaroons as long as it satisfies that caveat that it's trying to, uh, uh, to prove. So in the example here uh, on the left, you'll see there's a block storage system like what we were talking about. There's a web service that pulls from that and is able to expose um, block storage to a client, uh, C. Uh, the, web, uh, the website service um, basically has an authority service uh, or an authentication service that it trusts and it has this kind of shared uh, k.a uh, key. Um, and it, when it uh, gets a macaroon from uh, the block storage, which is um, the, uh, the grayed out blocks over there, so the random nonce plus uh, a chunk range plus uh, a set of operations that the web client is able to do on that, it is then able to add a caveat on top of that, um, that one, uh, cav at as.com, uh, and then in, um, it's that caveat basically specifies um, that an external service, um, the, the uh, author authorization service, must do um, a check um, and uh, that uh, success or failure must be provided in a, a macaroon back to the service as a separate macaroon. Um, that web service also then adds on two extra caveats, like this guy can only read 255, and he sends that up to the client. So the client now has this uh, macaroon which he wants to be able to, to use on the block storage service to pull out data. Um, if he sent it to block storage service without the uh, discharge macaroon, uh, that service would basically be like, hey, you didn't fulfill this one caveat, I can't allow you access. So what he does is he sends uh, this macaroon over to um, the authority service and it is able to verify that he's user Ted and then basically um, Git creates a new macaroon um, to hand back to him saying, hey, you're Ted, um, I verified that you can still, uh, that you are Ted until like January 1st, 2015, and, um, and that you are coming from this client IP address. And then it signs that and, and prevents any future caveats being added to that uh, macaroon by, by re-signing the signature, uh, which breaks uh, the ability to add more caveats. Then the client provides both of those caveats, uh, both of those macaroons back to the block storage service who is able to check all of these conditions and basically give you the thumbs up. 
So this is the formula stuff. Um, so these are a couple of the, um, uh, the basic operations with some uh, kind of heavy duty uh, formula, uh, note, uh, I guess, um, listed out to, so you can kind of see how they work. Uh, the very basic one over there on the far left uh, takes a key, an ID, and a location, um, generates a signature using a, a standard MAC on the key and the ID, and uh, returns a MAC rune uh, with that data in there and a signature. Uh, MAC runes are basically made up of uh, a single ID, which is the, uh, um, the root ID I was talking about originally, a list of caveats, which in this case is an empty, um, empty list, and a signature. Um, once you get that back, then any first or third party service can begin adding caveats to it. Um, there is a, uh, the, set in the next one down is basically a way to add a uh, helper onto the uh, caveat. Um, I think the more interesting ones are kind of the add third party caveat, which um, allows a third party to um, provide their key ID and location, uh, encode that around the original signature with their key, um, coming up with a new ID, and then um, uh, call back into the add caveat helper to um, create uh, a new caveat um, signed uh, on top of the original macroon and then return that data. Um, so you can see in there um, in the add caveat helper where it returns macroon at location and it's using the original ID and the um, uh, the two cookie, uh, not cookie, but the two caveat uh, lists um, concatenated there. Uh, you can see it says list append on, on the side with that arrow. And then the, the new signature um, on, that, on that concatenated data. Um, same thing with uh, add first party caveat, but you'll notice that um, for add uh, first party caveats, uh, they don't require an extra um, key because they're using the original root key. So that's why it's passed in kind of as, as a zero. Um, uh, the verification over there as well. Uh, I'm just going to skip that, unless anybody really wants to go through all that. What's the yeah. yeah. the verify? That's the one thing. Like, what's the DEC? Yeah. Where? The CK is DEC, CSIG, DI. Because it's like, my, my concept of HBAC is you don't get to decode, but I, 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 I'm seeing that they are decoding, so. No, oh, well, well but. What they're actually doing there is uh, regenerating. Uh, so the way that they verify is by um, starting at the very beginning and um, running through the entire HMAC process okay. to generate that each one of them sense, matches. Yeah. So they check um, if they're able to start from the beginning using that root ID. Uh -huh. um, they're able to recreate each of the signatures in order and then check those signatures um, yeah. by generating the next step all the way down until you get to the final signature. Right. And so. Um, the interesting bit about that, and kind of a, a limitation that I'll cover in a second, is um, the only person who can actually do that is the person who had the original root right. key. Yep. So um, any third-party service is unable to actually check the validity of your macaroon. They're simply able to check their caveats and pass it on to someone else. And they push their keys onto the macaroon. Yes. So that yes. Root key. Okay. Cool. Yeah. So so right. each new person that adds it in there adds all the steps necessary to actually verify and when they pass it back to the original service, um, the original service is able to check and make sure that everything is satisfied. I felt like it was important to go into that, thank you. Uh, yeah, actually, yeah, I'm glad you brought it up. Um, so how do we store these and pass them around? Um, traditional cookies basically use client data. Um, we have this built-in automatic system for submitting cookie data on any request back up to website. So to emulate that, we could um, either use per request payloads, or maybe we just store it in a really large cookie. Um, this is still much more difficult than actually um, uh, than actual cookies because the ability to take that cookie data and then attune it requires that it be passed between domains. So the original um, the original service that's creating a, co a cookie doesn't necessarily know who is going to be using it from some third party service. Um, it, it's very difficult. Um, it would only really work on the client side, and even then, you'd have to be able to pull it out and submit it to a different domain. It's just it's, it doesn't work very well with the traditional kind of uh, cookie idea, and there's nothing built into browsers right now to uh, allow that. Um, so the the next kind of option would be to use a storage URL instead of a cookie. Um, the idea being here, you could 
um, take that data and a service may post it to some known location for a, another service to be able to draw from, read that um, macaroon data, um, and then attenuate it and post it to another location and then provide that URL all the way up for all these attenuated uh, macaroons um, to the client who then, when he makes his request, could then provide the URL to the original service to say, hey, look, I've done this. Um, it's, it's possible, it's kind of awkward, it's also, um, it's also difficult to uh, know exactly how um, updating and storing discharge macaroons may work um, since some of these uh, caveats may require additional steps outside of, um, uh, outside of just modifying the original macaroon. Um, but it's, it's possible by um, having a third-party service basically create another new URL and have the client track all of them and be able to provide an entire list of URLs to the original service um, when he goes to authenticate himself. Um, the, uh, the other kind of negative is that it's, once you start doing this, you're going to need like a service to store these um, because all the macaroon data is, is stored behind the URL, which means it needs long-term kind of... Uh, uh, storage support. Um, so let's let's look at some of the uh, the benefits that macaroons will actually bring to us. Um, cookies are too simple right now. Um, in this idea, in this world where basically we're having a lot of different cloud services where they need to be able to uh, talk with each other, um, direct client to server authentication is often often too simple, um, and it's usually tied directly to kind of a server side storage. Um, it also can't be shared, which is one of the major reasons they, they looked at creating these. Uh, you can't just hand off your cookie to someone else. It's very difficult to do that. I guess you could probably copy and paste it and somebody could make their own cookie uh, outside of the browser and then have the browser send it. Um, but no one's going to do that. And we don't have any controls in the browser to actually allow us to do that. Um, so um, Macaroon's a system where basically we'd be able to um, set this data at URLs and point to all these different auth uh, um, Macaroon's is, is kind of a, a better system in the long run, but much more awkward. Um, the real benefit over an SPKI um, system is basically the efficiency and the ease of adoption. Um, though it's been around for, uh, both of those systems have been around for a long time and neither of them have really been um, kind of embraced by any of the web community um, as a whole. You, do, you don't um, have something built into your browser right now that allows you to basically do uh, this kind of shared public key infrastructure. Um, it's very difficult as I discovered at my last company when I tried to do this stuff and we ended up basically recreating a CA for our website and assigning keys out to everybody. Um, so. That being said, many of the benefits of macaroons can be found in, in SPKI, but they have uh, SPKI uh, has a larger overhead. Um, the cost of decrypting all that information and tracing um, tracing signature data all the way back up is, is very difficult. Um, another benefit is that there's a certain amount of optimization that may be done, that may be done uh, to a macaroon in order to reduce um, the cost of the, of the HMAC. Uh, for instance, one of these might be to combine that, that list of caveats. Instead of signing every individual one, you could sign a group of caveats. Um, and then uh, that would reduce the number of signatures that you need to check when you're recreating all of it. Um, and then let's cover some concerns. Uh, only the target service that mints a macaroon can check its validity. This is something that um, that came up, uh, I guess, when we were talking about verifying. But um, that root key that is created by the original service is not shared out um, to any other services, which means that macaroon is really only applicable when you're sending it back to the um, original service because he's the only one who can check that all the signatures work all the way down. Um, it also, um, e even so, the efficiency of the uh, macaroons may, may be a worthwhile trade-off for that uh, because any other service may also be able to set up their own macaroons and basically pass them around. Um, they're kind of a, a lightweight enough uh, thing that uh, a browser could um, track possibly thousands of, of macaroons 
Um, for instance, if they're on an image share website and uh, they want access to basically read um, thousands of uh, images, they could, uh, for each one, they could have an attenuated uh, macaroon specifically for that one image um, while still allowing uh, the service to basically turn off all of those accesses um, by, uh, by making one of the previous attenuated caveats uh, false. So if the guy if the guy's session expires or the time's out or whatever, then all those cookies go away and you don't have to worry, uh, not cookies, but the, all the macaroons go away and you don't have to worry about cleaning them up. Um, so the primaries have to understand the, ca uh, the caveats. So any, any services that are gonna be modifying these have to kind of speak a common, uh, common language. Um, when you add these caveats in there, it has to know, hey, this time one, uh, you know, uh, works the same way so that say it has to be before a certain date well a third party that wants to attenu uh, attenuate that to uh, an earlier date and make it expire uh, more quickly uh, would have to know how to be able to read that and understand it and write its own format in there um, and, and then when they provide that back to the original service the original service has to be able to, to check that and make sure that they know what it is um, I, I didn't really see a standard anyone had defined yet for this um, they have a uh, they have a, a library, an example library out, um, but uh, that's about it. Um, encoding key identifiers. So um, this is something that where the original identifier used to um, uh, to create the uh, macaroon of that random nonce that I was talking about. Um, instead of instead of storing that and, and having to check that with the key. Um, on each service, you could possibly use a symmetric or public key encryption um, on that data instead and pass it around, and that way only the original service could be able to check that, but not have to worry about storing that nonce uh, for long term. Um, another concern is that the root keys used for these macrons should not be reused, um, just in case uh, malicious parties may obtain the root key. Um, and they, they'd be able to mint a, kind of a caveat discharge that then allows anyone using that original root key um, on the, in their macaroon uh, to uh, basically have a discharge macaroon that says, hey, this guy has already fulfilled all these things, whether or not he has, and provide it, basically tricking the system. Um, caveat root keys can be regenerated and created from the, sig uh, the signature of the embedding macaroon uh, using an arbitrary nonce. Um, that's basically the way that they uh, recommended doing it. Uh, privacy. Um, this is kind of an interesting thing, but not anything specific to macaroons. Um, an attacker may try to add uh, a new third-party caveat uh, onto a macaroon to try and trick a user into revealing some private information to them. Um, this is no different from any other kind of phishing or spoofing type things um, uh, that exist using normal cookies. Uh, it's, it's the same kind of um, attack and uh, the user doing um, being attacked would have to make certain requests and be observed um, by the attacking service so it's it's still kind of an issue this is not designed to solve that issue um, but uh, it's something to be aware of so lots of information uh, they're pretty interesting um, in terms of uh, basically extending existing cookies using some cryptographic um, methods to allow this idea of sharing um, access. Uh, so that despite a dependency on the root, uh, that root key, uh, third, parties, third party services don't necessarily need to have access to the root, root key. So um, it makes for sharing and it's a pretty cool idea. Um, Kind of a, a downside there is that there's not much widespread adoption yet. Uh, there's no implementation of browsers. Uh, there is one uh, library, uh, libmacaroons, with two language implement implementations in C and Python. Uh, there is also very limited uh, reference resources. There is simply the white paper that I was reading and the, the actual uh, first party implementation of that white paper. Um, outside of that, there, there are surprisingly few results. Mostly it's just references back to the white paper. Um, it's also more complicated to verify this than just using regular cookie checks. We kind of know that because 
cookies just allow uh, broad access, right? It's it's one thing. Do you have it? Does that value match? Okay, you can do anything, and I have to make sure in my services to limit what you're able to do. Um, even though it's simple, uh, it has the benefit of authorization attunement, um, which is, which is a nice feature. Um, in general, I think we should keep our eye on it um, for growth in the community. See if anyone's actually ever going to use this. Um, it is a solution that's targeted at distributed web services, so that kind of uh, matches the direction we're going right now. Um, the Reach Cloud Control Panel aggregates, uh, aggregates many services together. Um, they might be able to use, well, it probably aggravates them too. Um, but it, by pulling all those services together, they'd be able to um, kind of have a central authority that hands out uh, macaroons to individual services, which then can attune that for uh, a specific user. So. Um, uh, I don't know how your guys' services are actually broken up, but... Yeah, this would just be wonderful, or something like this, where um, currently you get kind of the God token, and the God token, if it's compromised, so there's a vulnerability in object storage. Well, object storage is going to go and delete all of your servers. So um, one way to get around this is to set up a bunch of different users and say, this is my object storage user, this is my compute user. So now right. you can't do it, but that's a, it, all, it all gets yeah, done to you. With the, more management right. overhead for all that because you have all so, those different identities. Yeah, if the identity if the identity service which says, hey, we're gonna you're gonna we're gonna give you now not just one token, but like you get these twelve little keys to to use. Um, I think that that made that makes attacks a lot more challenging. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then the last point there is our uh, especially for my team um, as we move towards more discrete services, we would be able to benefit, um, um, especially here with our, uh, right now we tie into Keystone and we basically get back a token and we use that and store it in the user session up front, but it would be nice to be able to split that up into um, access per service, which is something uh, John and I have been talking about a little bit. Um, say the calendar service and the, uh, and the documents and all that stuff are all separate macaroons and then if you want to share a document or an email or something like that, you would be able to mint a macaroon specifically tied to sharing that with another user, um, whether or not they have an account on the RSC system, and basically say, uh, you know, I want to share this with uh, with this guy. He has to provide maybe this this temporary password, and it's only good for a day. And then they'd be able to share a specific document or access to some specific resource for just a limited amount of time, and then it would expire. Um, so that's in um, the end. There are, are in fact, snacks left. Um, I've got some references and stuff on here. If you guys want the slide deck, I could probably do that. Yeah, yeah, we'll put it on the YouTube page. Okay, cool. So that's about it. And then we'll do questions. <laughs>